Hello, it's Martin from Wisely Automotive and I'm in Scotland. Unfortunately, it's almost lunchtime, which is not very convenient because the last time I left Scotland at lunchtime, I got home at, I think, 4 a.m. At that time, I was driving a Renault, so with, with no DC rapid charging, but this time around, it should be a bit different because I've got this lovely Polestar 2. Let me jump inside though, because in the usual Scottish fashion, it's quite chilly outside. I'm located in the Ingliston Park and Ride, to be exact, and that is very close to Edinburgh Airport. That there is the airport itself. A lovely location if you want to continue into the city of Edinburgh or you're picking someone up from an airport and need a top up, because there only used to be one rapid charger and a couple of slow AC points but it seems like it has expanded massively since the last time I've been here. And now I couldn't even bother to count the chargers because there are simply too many. This is how charging infrastructure should look like. With plenty of rapids, especially good for taxi drivers, and lots of slow AC points with 12 hours maximum stay for people who just want to drop their car and continue into the city. The Polestar 2 seems like a very popular choice here in Scotland. So over there is one example. My particular one is currently at 95%, that's perfect, supposedly having 230 miles of range. And it is the one with the big long range battery and dual motor all wheel drive, and also the additional pilot and plus packages. This is definitely our pick of the range, we already sold one and have a couple more incoming as well, and I will discuss why that is just as I set off. Speaking of which, let's stop the sat now. As you can see, I've already logged in with my Google, Polestar and Spotify accounts. So on that front, I'm all good. And unlike usual, where I kind of fumble with ZapMap and try to work out the optimum route, let's see what Google thinks in this case. So obviously it is showing that I do not have enough charge to get to our office. So if I click Add Charging Stop, it should be clever enough to plan the route for me. Interesting. So I thought I would be going along the East Coast. This is a bit different. Let's see, can I change the settings? Even after playing about with the map, I can't get it to suggest the route along the east coast, which is a bit bizarre because it literally did it before I picked up the camera. Given it's a bit shorter and this is a young, relatively low mileage vehicle, I just directly add the charging stop it suggested initially. I know that there is a shell recharge station near Durham and it seems like all the stations are available and I will have 29% on arrival, 145 miles. Well, we will see about that. Okay, so finally setting off, literally two hours later than expected. Air conditioning I will turn on, but I will leave it in eco climate mode and maybe I can put it up to 20 degrees Celsius. I've got the Google Maps nicely projected into the instrument cluster. In case you hate that, obviously you can get rid of it and you've got a more minimal display. But this is good and it means that I can keep an eye on the range using the Range Assistant app on the main screen. And I reset the trip computer so we can track the efficiency of our journey. First impressions? Well, it's not really first impressions because I have driven a Polestar 2 very briefly before, but I literally got up to about 20 miles per hour around the block. So this will be my first proper long journey in the Polestar. So far, I really like it. Inadvertently, I think I will make a lot of comparison to the Tesla Model 3, which is pretty much a direct competitor to this. However, if you look kind of more up close at them, they are quite different cars and they really cater to people with different kind of preferences in technology design and what a car at the end of the day should be. Okay, I'm staying on this road for a couple of miles, so let me talk to you about the driving experience, because this is something which you can't read about in a spec sheet. If you go into the car menu, you will see that you can change the steering wheel, you can have proper one pedal driving, and you can turn on or off creep. So very nice that you are able to customize the EV drivetrain exactly to your liking. You can make it behave like a combustion engine vehicle, or you can have it handle like a proper EV. And I'm 
specifically saying proper EV because the one pedal driving is extremely good. Firstly, it may be slightly unusual for a modern car, but you do not get any kind of performance driving modes, sport, eco, nothing. The accelerator pedal calibration has been set for one smooth, consistent driving experience. When you set off, it's not overly sharp, which is what many cars do these days to make them feel a bit more sporty. And when you get further deep into the pedal travel, you don't get much more power. This is very nice and linear, super smooth. Not having multiple modes does not only make it simpler for the driver, but it means that with the smooth calibration Polestar has achieved, the car is very easy to park and maneuver slowly, yet you get full power in the case of this all-wheel drive, 300 kilowatts of it, the moment you put your foot down without any delay. Which is not the case for Teslas, because when you switch them over to chill mode, not only is the accelerator mapping different, but also the top power is dropped. More often than not with EVs, it's braking which is the difficult part, especially on cars which have blended brakes and the Polestar is one of those because you can customize whether you want the car to coast or region when you let go of the accelerator pedal. But as much as Porsche likes to go on about how amazing their brake by wire system is and so on, I think I will go on record saying that this actually beats it. Just like the accelerator, the brake is very linear, smooth, predictable, and even in the one pedal driving mode, when you let go of the accelerator, the car comes super smoothly to a stop. You can't feel the friction brakes blending in at the very last moment to hold the car. And when they release the car as you're starting on a hill, for example, again, you can't even feel the transition from brakes to power. So very, very well done on Polestar. And in terms of smoothness, consistency and predictivity, on par with the Tesla Model 3. And if you've seen our previous videos, you know that in my opinion, Teslas are currently at the top in terms of drivetrain calibration. So that's all good. You see, so now as I'm coming up to the roundabout, region is kicking in. Even though the battery is quite full, I do have a substantial amount of region. I don't know whether you can see it in the instrument cluster. Slowing down. Exit the roundabout onto the City of Edinburgh bypass. Continue on the City of Edinburgh bypass for two miles. Let's see, 70 miles per hour. There's a Tesla next to me. Yeah, as I said, when you want it to go, it goes. By the way, if you hear any of the rattling in the back, don't worry, it's not the car. I just have trade plates and obviously all of the camera equipment on different brackets mounted all over the place. So that's what you are hearing. Overall, it feels like a very solid vehicle. There's no kind of rattles coming from the trims. And because we do not have frameless windows, it is very, very well insulated, especially from wind noise, but also road noise on these surfaces. It feels like it's a bit better than the Model 3. And in fact, I would maybe say even than the Porsche. The problems with the Porsche we had, that was on massive wheels. So yeah, this is the example coming to a complete stop behind this Model Y. Ah, we're not stopping. But still, I can exactly modulate the power Excellent. I have put the pilot assist on. That means it's doing the steering for me. As you can see now, I really should have the hands on the wheel. This is just to show you how it works. And it also uses the adaptive cruise control to keep me a safe distance from the vehicle ahead. And yeah, it accelerates nicely as I put the indicator on. But what I will do, I will just settle in. I will experience it for, let's see how many miles do I have to the charging stop. 128 miles and I will keep you updated about how I'm getting on with the journey. So yeah, I think I will put my Spotify on and listen to music through this Harman Kardon sound system. How far away is it to Wenderby services? You are 168 miles away from Moto Weatherby. Yeah, so I wish I could push it to there, but 
the current range is showing 170 miles, projected 140. So unfortunately that won't happen. But it's still showing 25% remaining in the Shell Recharge Station. So all should be good. It's just a shame that I can't time it perfectly. So I would roll in on 5% and then jump to the next station to do the longest possible legs. Okay, let's see roundabout. You know, these are my favorite for testing handling of cars on the roads. Exit the roundabout onto A1. Continue on a yes, it's good. Miles. The steering rack is significantly slower than a Model 3, but in that sense it feels a bit more like a normal car, whereas the Model 3 and the i3, they have this very kind of darty, go-karty feel. Again, matter of preference, but very smooth and linear steering. I think that's actually the one word to describe this car, smooth, because everything is just kind of very nicely damped, everything behaves the way you would expect it to, and I'm cruising on the pilot assist, listening to music. Maybe this is the car which will change me from being a Tesla fanboy. Because yeah, so far, loving it. And loving the view as well. I'm at the first charging stop and as calculated by Google Maps I arrived exactly with 25% in the battery and that prediction was staying very very constant throughout the journey so that's good to know. Polestar 2 does support battery preconditioning for DC rapid charging. It wasn't there from the get-go but it got it as an over-the-air software update and just for the record if we look into the system settings this car is running version 2.4 I believe the latest one is 2.5 but that probably hasn't been fully rolled out to the entire fleet and I believe there's also 2.6 but that's not an OTA you need to go to the workshop for that and I think it's just some sort of a bug fix so the features of that one will be rolled out in 2.7 but anyways back to the topic of charging I don't think you can see the charging screen but I've literally been plugged in for six minutes and I'm already at 40% getting 115 kilowatts. The moment I plugged in, the charging rate shot up to about 150 kilowatts, which is what the Polestar 2 is rated at. And when I arrived, it was fairly quiet, but now that has changed. There is a Mustang Mach-E, a Corsa-E, and an MG5 plugged in. But I'm not planning on staying long, so let's see what the situation is like. I think now we can navigate directly to the office and let's use the voice control. Navigate to work. Navigating to work. I see, so it doesn't realize that we are charging, so that's the reason why it wants me to get to stop number one with the current charge and then stop number two. So we will ignore that for now and we will let it charge for a while. I also use this brake to set up the Polestar mobile app. The process is quite straightforward, but the functionality is relatively basic. One important thing to mention is that if you want to use the phone as a key, that functionality is only available on cars with the Plus Pack. But honestly, it's not that big of a deal, given unlike with the Model 3, you still get a traditional key fob with comfort access. I just realized it's 3 p.m. and I still haven't eaten today, so I will grab something from the petrol station and we can then look at the plan again and see what the car thinks. But I'm expecting a stop somewhere probably around Peterborough. Got the snacks now and I've been happily charging and I just realized this is 85p per kilowatt hour, making Ionity look really cheap. So it's time to get moving. I'm already at 80% charging rate has dropped below 50 kilowatts, but still maintaining quite decent 40 kilowatts at that high state of charge. If I go into the trip computer, you see I've done about 144 miles so far and for that leg, given I started with 95%, I used about 70%. So I'm doing about two miles for every percent of battery. So if I now put in the work address, I should realize I need a charging stop. Yes, please. Oh, and I get a choice. Amazing. I think I've been at one of these before. So if I choose the Shell one, it says I will arrive there with 21%, 33 minutes of charge, and I will get to work with 10%. That's perfect. Start that. 
that's 85 percent in the tank time to get going no need to stay any longer i'm back on the a1m so let's discuss some of the driver assist stuff because i've been using it pretty much on the entire journey up until now and it's really good i think i will bring up the settings for you so you can see what options there are now keep in mind that this car comes with the optional pilot package and to make it even more confusing there was temporarily a pilot light package available because of the covid supply shortages but let's go back and discuss what standards I kind of glossed over the fact that Polestar may be a brand which you haven't heard about before, but it's pretty much a Volvo underneath. It shares the underpinnings with the XC40. So it's designed as a very safe car, both in terms of active and passive safety. That means that all of the sensors and the safety features which you come to expect these days, like for example collision avoidance, lane departure warning, and stuff like that are all standard and you can see them laid out here so you've got the lane keep aid you've got traffic sign recognition and so on the tiles which have the little three dots here in the top corner they provide you with more customization options and this is where the optional package comes available because even though a standard i believe every Polestar 2 has a front-facing camera at the top of the windscreen which scans the road ahead for the lane markings and vehicles it also has a radar integrated into the front well fake grille really every car also has the same steering wheel with the same set of buttons and controls but there is one big thing even though it may seem like all cars have the adaptive cruise it's only cars which have the pilot package have that option unlocked and as of right now which is february 2023 there is no way to unlock adaptive cruise post purchase which even though i think is a bit strange because volvo is essentially leaving money on the table but hey ho their decision i know some people are not super huge fans of adaptive cruise control i think it should be standard on any 40 50 grand car which is what this car falls into but i've got some good news you see that aspect is customizable as well so you can choose whether you want just a speed limiter cruise control which is available on all pole stars or you can go for the adaptive cruise control you can kind of see here that the car was designed with kind of scandinavia in mind because what is often the case is that these adaptive cruise control don't perform the best in snowy conditions when some of the sensors for example get blocked and we see this on i3s all the time if you drive an i3 with adaptive cruise control into the sunset the system will simply disengage so far even though i've been driving into the sun quite a bit that hasn't happened but it's nice to know that you've got the option to turn it off in case the sensors are glitchy or you simply prefer not to use adaptive cruise control but your partner who you are sharing the car with does so those are the basics of the settings covered if i want to actually engage the cruise control system i have to press the cruise control button here and now i can release my feet from the pedals if i press plus and mine is on the steering wheel a single time the car will jump up and down in five mile per hour increments if i want to be very precise and i want to for example drop down to 68 miles per hour i just press and hold and it will do one mile per hour at a time a little bit counterintuitive but if you think about it it does really make sense because you usually kind of just jump to the speed limit in five miles per hour increments the next thing which i don't know whether you can see on camera is a little icon of a steering wheel with a hand holding it that's the lane centering so basically polestar's equivalent of tesla's autopilot system what it means that it doesn't only give me a warning if i get close to the lane marking but it pretty much keeps the center of the lane it's still very much a driver assistance system not kind of autonomous driving so you should keep your hands on the wheel and you are still responsible for the control of the vehicle but it really makes long motorway drives super easy and it still was performing quite well even on some of the country roads the moment you turn on the indicator the system disengages to let you change the lane and then it automatically locks onto the new lane so there is no need to separately engage the lane centering like with teslas so even though it may not be as clever as autopilot the problem with autopilot is that sometimes it's too clever for its own good this is kind of a nice seamless driver support system if you want to just use the adaptive cruise without the lane centering you can press the right hand arrow on the left side of the steering wheel and now i still have the car highlighted with the cruise control icon 
but the steering wheel icon went off, meaning that I now have full control of the steering. But I still have lane departure warning, meaning if I were to cross the lane marking or get close to it, like for example now, is the, the steering wheel is kind of moving on its own and it's trying to push me back into my lane. Perfect, I will turn on the lane centering because I really like all of this techy stuff and I will pretty much let the car do most of the driving now. I'm just sitting here enjoying the road. If you want to change the follow distance, you've got these two buttons on the left side of the steering wheel again and you can either close the gap down or increase it as you see fit. It's not a fixed gap, it's more like a coefficient, so it does change depending on speed to make sure that you are always a safe distance from the vehicle ahead of you. What more to say? Um, so far, obviously, I've done about 150 miles with the car and there haven't really been any issues with phantom braking. I had one very mild scenario as I was passing under a bridge, which used to be very common for radar-based systems because as the radar bounces off the bridge, the car may recognize it as an obstacle, but it was very brief and only dropped down by about one or two miles per hour, so nothing dramatic. And secondly, the car was quite hesitant earlier on in a construction zone as I was trying to pass other traffic. I was still in my lane, but it was in fact one of those very narrow lanes. So I think in that scenario, it's quite fair that the car is cautious and doesn't want to get involved in an accident by trying to squeeze through a gap which is simply too narrow for it. On the country roads, it performed quite well, even on kind of blind bends and around big lorries, which is sometimes the problem for other cruise control systems. So overall, as I said, I like my technology and I'm satisfied. Just for comparison, if you want to see how other cars are doing with these systems, even though they are very, very similar these days, I've done dedicated videos of the Porsche InnoDrive system on the Taycan and on the Tesla Autopilot system, including the full self-driving package and actually how that works in practice in the UK. So I will leave both of those linked in the top right-hand corner. On top of these driver assistance gadgets, the pilot package also has a couple of other extras in it. It has the 360 degree parking camera, which gives you the top down view, which as you could see, I use quite a lot when parking because it makes it very easy to be perfectly positioned in the parking bay. And it also has some lighting features. To be exact, it has the pixel LED matrix headlights, which I am very keen to explore once the sun sets. And as you can see, it won't be long before that happens. And secondly, it also has some, I believe, additional cornering lights built into the LED fog lamps, which are lower down in the bumper and possibly a couple of other things. The difference between the light and the full package is that the light had to drop the matrix lights. Is that a big deal? Mm, let's be honest, they are still full LED lights, so I'm sure they are good. And they do have the high beam assistant, meaning the car will switch to dip beam the moment it recognizes any other traffic but especially if you drive a lot on country roads or the long distance drives at night, I think it's worth going for matrix lights because they really are a fantastic safety feature. Not only that, because when you actually look at the competition, you've got the BMW i4 and the Tesla Model 3. This is one of the major differentiating factors from the Tesla, because even though the facelifted Model 3 seems to have the hardware for matrix technology, where it can turn off individual segments of the lights, the full high beam functionality still has not been activated to this day. And that car has been on the market for pretty much two years now, something like that. So I am not holding my breath anymore. I think Tesla did it to simplify manufacturing and to make sure that they can use the same headlight for left and right hand drive markets, which results in more flexibility with allocating orders. It streamlines the supply chain because you are buying the same parts in bigger volume so you can get the cost per part lower. And even as a Tesla fan, even the standard high beam assistant which Teslas do have is not that reliable. It often takes very long to dip the beam and then even longer to again restart the high beam. So yeah, that's definitely one of the reasons to go for the Polestar. But I will reserve my final judgment for when I get back to the office after the sun has set.
Okie dokes, so this should be the last stop. As I plugged in, the charging power gradually rose to about 80 kilowatts where it kind of stabilized. I would say that's quite okay because these chargers are not rated at 150 kilowatts. I believe they're just 120 and realistically I've never actually seen them deliver that power. So I will put it down to the charger. And given I had dinner at McDonald's, I of course had to go for the obligatory Mac plant. And while I was stuffing my face, the car is already at 85%. So I think that's in fact too much charge because there is no need to stop here for this long. So let's do the voice control again. You don't even need to press the button. You can just use the hot words. So let me show you. Hey Google, navigate to work. Navigating to work. I mean, this is how voice control should work. This was instant. It will do everything. It's showing 30% on arrival. That's really a lot more than I need. So I can enjoy the heating. I've already preheated the cabin. It's nice and warm in here because it's five degrees outside. So yeah, I can unplug and get going. So far, the efficiency over the last 300 miles has been about 36 and a half kilowatt hours per 100 miles. I will work out what that is in all the other units and I will list that in here. But the last section, as I promised, if you haven't clicked away yet or fallen asleep, is going to be the matrix LED headlights. And as the sun sets, I already turned them on so I got a taste of how the system works. And let me tell you, I can't wait to show you because it's very, very impressive. So what I will try to do, I'm filming this footage on kind of a big camera instead of these small GoPros, which are not the best quality, especially at night. So I will try to mount it onto the mount again and point it towards the road so you can see as close to real life as possible what the lights are doing. For better or for worse, you won't get to see my face, but I think you will manage. You can also now see the Pulsar logo being projected onto the sunroof. Pointless? Yes. But also cool and gives the car something a little bit extra. So setting off. By the way, yeah, there is no start-stop button. So yeah, you just put the car into drive when you have the key in the vehicle and it will start for you. And likewise, when you're in park and you walk out, it will turn off. So all in 200 very... yards, turn right onto A151. Thank you very much. So all very seamless. I can already see the cornering lights doing their job, but we are not in adaptive mode yet. To go into the full matrix mode, the light switch has a dedicated auto position. So I've just flicked them on and a little auto symbol comes on in the instrument cluster. And you can now hopefully see that the matrix lights are on because the high beam is on. So what is happening in case you can't see it on camera? If you look at the hedge or the bushes and the trees on the left, all of that is illuminated using my high beams, even though there's a vehicle ahead. And the vehicle is literally cut out from the light beam. So I'm not dazzling the car in front. And now you see the light beam has also extended on the right side. So for example, now you see that the left car is cut out, the vehicle ahead is cut out, but in between the lorry and the car on the left, as we start passing, you see the pole star is trying to illuminate those trees. Same thing if you keep looking at the central divider, the high beam is fully on on the right now. And as the cars are coming ahead, they are blocked out from the main beam. And this is happening very, very quickly. You see now the left is illuminated. I can't even keep on commenting on what's happening. But if you keep kind of watching the side of the road, hopefully we'll be able to see where the beam is shining. The principle and the idea of this is very simple and that's that you have as much illumination as possible without dazzling other drivers and there's kind of zero workload on me essentially. And you see even when we have a central reservation, it's doing just fine and I'm not getting flushed at by other road users.
and if there's for example an animal or something like that hiding in the bushes you should be able to spot their eyes much sooner than if you just had your dipped beam on because the high beam is so good and so precise that it's essentially shining past the vehicles ahead of me and there's a speed limit reduction so let's slow it down 15. My initial concern was, because this used to be the problem with earlier systems, is that they would be either too slow to react, or in case like this where you would have lorry drivers who sit quite high up but you can't see their main headlights, uh, it would absolutely just dazzle them, but in this case it seems to be all good. And yeah, I don't know how it's coming across on camera, but right now I can literally see that the middle part of the beam is blanked off but the left side is fully illuminated and so is the right side and as the cars are passing by only that little section of the beam is blocked off so the way the system works behind the scenes is that it's using the camera in the front windscreen to detect what's happening around it and when it detects vehicles it can turn on and off individual LEDs in the projector units in the light clusters because each of those LEDs has a very respective sharp light pattern. I mean, it's just a mesmerizing technology to watch. And if you ever had a car which already had some sort of adaptive headlights, especially where it detects other traffic, you can't even imagine how much of a leap the technology has made in the past, I would say, 10 years. Early on, it used to be quite crappy, to be honest. It would detect vehicles too late, you would get flushed by other drivers that you are not properly turning off your high beams, then it would take forever to put them on, just not very useful in practice. And the same thing goes for these adaptive style headlights. When first of them came out, a lot of the blanking of the beam was done purely mechanically, so they were blinds and mirrors in the headlight clusters and the projectors could swivel left and right. But that only gives so many possibilities. Whereas with individual LEDs, and there are, I believe, hundreds of them in the Polestar, you can be very accurate about which part of the light is on and which one is off, and you can be pretty much instant. Where the future is headed is that there are going to be projector headlights, which literally look like black and white projectors you would have at the cinema. They are so high resolution that they will be also able to draw patterns on the road ahead, like for example your navigation instructions, or in the age of self-driving cars, project instructions for other road users like pedestrians and cyclists to communicate the car's intent. And this is not sci-fi, you can already order these headlights on for example some of the Audi e-trons and I believe some Mercedes products. It's still the early days, so they're very expensive, but hopefully, as with any other piece of technology, as the scale goes up, they will trickle down into more and more cars at more affordable price points. I really hope it's coming across on video. For me, it really is amazing. And because I see everywhere, it feels much closer to driving in the daylight. And with the adaptive crews doing the heavy lifting, it feels like I'm a passenger at this point. You see, it even sees those spark glories. Other than, of course, seeing outside that the lights are moving, the other way of knowing that something is happening is that there is a little automatic high beam symbol in the instrument cluster. And when that symbol is gray, it means that the system is in standby and it's ready to activate when the conditions are correct. And when the little headlight is blue, that means that at least a part of the high beam is active. And now as we come into an area which has street lighting, they are automatically switched into dipped beam. I turned off all of the eco climate and stuff because I want it to be nice and comfortable, but in fact it's turning into a bit of a sauna, so I'll probably turn down the temperature to 21 degrees. Let the Jesus calm down. This I've had happen a couple of times before. I don't know whether it's a fault with this particular car or whether the blind spot monitoring is just super aggressive, but yeah, it thinks that there is a car in the lane next to me even though there was nothing. And the car in the two lanes over from me was so far back that like it shouldn't matter.
And that's me back in the showroom. I will put up the stats for the entire journey on the screen now. 415 miles in total and I would say I covered it in reasonable time given the traffic conditions. However, if you drive EVs, what will probably catch your eye is the efficiency or better said the lack of it at under 3 miles per kilowatt hour. Unfortunately, there is no way around it. That's the price you pay for the more traditional boxy looks. And keep in mind the Polestar 2 is also about 300 kilos heavier than the equivalent dual motor long range Tesla Model 3. So at the end of the day, you can't beat physics. You have to keep in mind that the exterior temperature was quite low, between 4 and 8 degrees Celsius. And despite that, I managed to do the trip with only two charging stops and arrived with more than enough range in London. So I really didn't even need to charge for the full one and a half hours. One hour and 15 minutes would have easily done it. But that's the thing with these long range, high power charging EVs. You can try to shave a couple of minutes here and there. And even though the charging stops were not exactly optimal, you see, I still would have only saved about 15 to 20 minutes. So nothing significant. And during both of those charging stops, the car was waiting for me instead of me waiting for the car to charge. And combined with the Google Maps, which have excellent route planning, and live availability of chargers built in, the Polestar 2 really is a fantastic EV, even if you need to cover longer distances. Which brings me onto the topic of costs, and bear with me because this is the area which gets really complicated, especially because the electricity prices are all over the place these days. In total, if I charged at home to 95% at 34p per kilowatt hour, which is the current government set figure for price of electricity, and then the two top-up charges, the total would come out to £119. Keep in mind, because I arrived with 28% in the showroom, we need to subtract that. So if we want to calculate the cost per mile, I used 156 kilowatt hours of energy, and based on the charging stops I took, that works out to just under £103 to cover the entire 415-mile journey. Not terrible, but truth to be told, it's something you can easily achieve with a diesel combustion vehicle, which at the current price of diesel of about £1.70 per litre would need to achieve 31 miles per gallon. So definitely a realistic figure. If charging cost is the priority when you're out and about, you can use the grid surf chargers, which are now located at pretty much all the way to motorway service stations, as these are quite competitively priced even by today's standards at 66p per kilowatt hour, even for the high power units, which the Polestar 2 can utilize to get the maximum 150 kilowatt charging rate. Recalculating the cost based on those figures, with again the 34p per kilowatt hour charge at home and 66p per kilowatt hour on the road, the total would come down to just under 90 pounds, or in other words, roughly equivalent to 36 miles per gallon in a diesel vehicle. You see that's slowly getting better, but you may ask with 30, 35, 40 mpg, why even bother with all of this charging stuff? Well, the answer is in your usage pattern, because most of us do not really do long journeys that often. If you cover the same mileage, but charging only from home, at today's relatively expensive rate of 34p per kilowatt hour, it would only work out to 53 pounds for the 156 kilowatt hours. And that pretty much doubles the MPG equivalent to 60. Still not convinced? If you get an EV tariff from someone like Octopus, where the nitrate is usually about 15p per kilowatt hour, then the cost drops even further to just over 23 pounds. And to match just the refueling costs, you would need to get a diesel which achieves 137 miles per gallon. That's the reason why I'm saying that the whole topic of running costs with EVs can be quite complicated because it really depends on your personal circumstances and what kind of electricity tariff you are on because the span is really, really wide. Whereas with fuel, even though you pay a little bit more at motorway services, the difference is definitely not as significant. If you are buying from us, of course, we are happy to walk you through it. It's always good to know how many miles you do, what kind of MPG your current car does, how much you pay per kilowatt hour, and we can help you crunch the numbers. Because I'm sure that by the time the video comes out, there will be already some news in the electricity market, and you will probably need to sit down and redo the numbers yourself. And as I'm looking at my notes here, I realized I never really covered why the all-wheel drive version with the additional plus and pilot packages is the pick of the range in our opinion. So let me conclude on that topic. Firstly, the all-wheel drive drivetrain in our opinion at this point is a must on the Polestar 2. If you go for the single motor version, it's a front wheel drive setup. And that's acceptable on some cheaper compact city cars, for example, but at this price point, it really doesn't feel right, and you get significantly worse driving dynamics because of that fact. Especially with the electric torque, every time you come out of a corner and you put your foot down, the front wheels are just going to be spinning. 
Polestar has rectified this with the facelift where they switched to a rear-wheel drive layout by default, but even a base model facelift is still going to be more expensive than this pretty much fully loaded all-wheel drive version. That's thanks to the previous owner taking the biggest hit in depreciation, resulting in you getting, in our opinion, more car for less money. Next up, the packages. You've got the Plus, which features a lot of stuff, but the key items are the vast glass sunroof, fully electrically adjustable front memory seats, the Harman Kardon sound system, and so on. In fact, this pre-COVID spec also has the boot kick sensor, so you can open the tailgate without having to touch the car. There is one thing which the newer Polestars have in the Plus Pack, which these earlier ones don't, and that is a heat pump. However, don't expect it to do miracles in terms of range, because at least from what we understand, the biggest hit to the efficiency comes from the motors and the rest of the drivetrain. So even though the heat pump may improve the range slightly in the winter compared to what I got, you are still looking at figures in the same ballpark. The second pilot package, again, is a bit of a personal choice. Do you really need all of the driver assistance features? As you could probably tell from the video, I really like all of the gadgets, so I would definitely go for it. And I would not compromise by going for the light, because as you could hopefully see, those matrix lights are very impressive and they really improve safety and comfort if you travel a lot at night. I think that's about it. This example should be now ready for sale on Autotrader, so I will leave it linked down in the video description if you're interested to check it out. And I suppose the last question is, whether you would like to see a comparison between this and the Tesla Model 3. It has been done many, many times, but if enough people request it, we are happy to do it and try to squeeze it into our video schedule. Thank you very much for watching. Like the video if you enjoyed it and see you in the next one.